coming in, but I'm going to get started just as I said on the dot. We are timely here. Um, good evening, everybody, uh, and welcome to our virtual Red Bench. Um, I'm Abby, the director at the Vermont Ski and Snowboard Museum. Uh, tonight we have a discussion that we've all been very curious about. Um, it's sure to be interesting and super informative. Before I hand this over to Parker and our panel, there's a few things I want to go over. Um, we have a lot of current supporters joining us tonight, and we have a lot of new faces out there in the audience. Um, I can't actually see you, I just know that you're there. Uh, for those that aren't aware of our work, uh, we're a member and donor-supported nonprofit organization. Our mission is to collect, preserve, and celebrate the rich history of skiing and riding in Vermont. And the Red Bench Speaker Series includes monthly discussions that are relevant to skiing and riding today. Uh, this series is sponsored by Sisler Builders and Vermont Ski and Ride, who are both out in the audience tonight. So I want to thank them for their sponsorship and for tuning in. Um, we've made these virtual Red Bench events free. In the current world that we are living in, we didn't want to turn anyone away due to a registration fee. But with that being said, we hope that anyone with the ability to support our work does decide to make a donation. Um, and I know that many of you already have, so thank you for that. I'm going to sweeten the pot a little bit for every $10 donation received um, for this event you'll be entered into a raffle for a pair of darn tough socks and I'll raffle off two pairs. Um, the winner can choose between hiking socks, skiing socks, their size, and depending on the type of sock, you may even be able to pick your color. Uh, so a $10 donation gets you one entry, $20, two entries, $30, three, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I will draw the winner, um, the winners tomorrow morning to give you time to make your donations after the event and I'll put our donation link in the chat section as well. And on that same note, since there are so many new faces out there tonight, I just wanna share our membership drive that's gonna to launch tomorrow. So if you are not yet a member of the museum and you become a new member, you'll receive a pair of darn tough socks. If you are a current member and you upgrade your membership to the next level, you'll receive a pair of darn tough socks. So membership benefits include savings at participating Vermont ski areas, touring centers, golf courses, retailers, lodging properties. You get 15% 15 um, off in our shop. And then most levels include free admission to over a thousand museums across the country. So I hope you'll decide to join, support our work and enjoy the perks of being a member. All right, so I know I'm anxious to listen to this discussion. I know that you're all anxious to listen to this discussion. Um, at the end of the conversation, we'll take time to answer your questions. So type your questions in the Q&A box. It's at the bottom of your screen. Click that open, type your questions in there and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. Um, I'm going to let Parker introduce our panelists, but I do wanna thank each of you for joining us tonight and participating in this discussion. We've all had to adjust our operations and how we make ourselves available to the public, but the opening of ski resorts is on a whole other level, and I can only imagine how difficult um, that that has been. So, our moderator for the evening, Parker Wheely. Parker is a current museum board member and has 20 years of experience with the Vermont Ski Areas Association, where he served as the ski industry's chief lobbyist and media spokesperson, while also overseeing the marketing and public relations. Uh, Parker continues to work with ski industry interests and founded Get On Snow to promote the lifestyle and benefits of winter recreation. And with that kind of experience, he's the perfect moderator for tonight's discussion. So with that, I hand this over to you, Parker. Well, thanks so much, Abby. And uh, as you can see, I'm virtually broadcasting from the museum. and I've got the virtual red bench behind me where we would normally be gathered if we could be there physically like we usually would be for this series. But several linings, we have obviously the chance to have so many more participants uh, be here tonight with us from all over the planet and who can't, couldn't normally, normally get to, to stow to the museum. But thanks so much to these great panelists that we have who represent over 100 years of collective experience. And what's most impressive, each one of them is still at the ski area where they started their career. Uh, we have Bill Carnes, president of Bromley Mountain Resort. He's been there for nearly 40 years in just about every position 
along the way to becoming president. Bill Stritzler with Smuggler's Notch. He's the, been the managing director there since 1987 and has owned the resort since 1996. And John Hammond, the brand new president and COO of Sugarbush, though he's not new to that mountain, he's been there since 1991 when he started there as an intern in the marketing department. And I, once, like Bill Carnes has uh, been in just about every job since uh, before filling the top role left uh, when Wynn Smith just uh, recently uh, resigned. So there's a lot of st at stake here, as the panelists well know, and really everybody in the audience, I'm sure, knows. Uh, Vermont's very proud to be the fourth largest ski state in the country, with on average about four million skier visits. And those skier visits generate over 900 million in direct spending throughout the course of the winter, two thirds of which occur off mountain in the surrounding villages and towns. Another $700 million is generated through indirect and induced spending by virtue of that skier traffic. But the reality is 80% of those 4 million skier visits do come from out of state. Individual resorts have different percentage experiences, but the overall number is 80% out of state. And most of those are from Boston and the tri-state area, which when you look at the travel map are still glowing yellow and red at this point. We obviously hope that will change and improve and be, and be alleviated by the time snow flies. Uh, but that's obviously a cause of concern for the resorts. And they, as everybody knows and has seen in almost daily announcements, resorts across the country are generating their plans as best they can plan at this point. And uh, Vermont, the National Skiers Association has issued a pandemic playbook, a very extensive list of best practices and tips and uh, proposals for how to deal with everything for mountain operations. And we know the Vermont Skiers Association on behalf of the industry here in Vermont has submitted a plan to the Agency of Commerce for their consideration, which we hope they'll approve very quickly. And that'll give obviously a great foundation for all the resorts in Vermont to work from. But before we get to that, uh, what's great about these panelists, of course, they represent ski areas who have some very robust summer activities. Obviously not as robust this year, unfortunately, um, but let's start with John Hammond at Sugarbush. Let's talk and share with us a little bit of what the summer experience was for you, for the guests, for you, the resort, and, and what you learned along the way. So uh, up here at Sugarbush, really, we focused on getting our maintenance done early and trying to get right on it. So we've done a lot of capital projects, um, sort of behind the scenes stuff that people wouldn't realize, gearbox in Bravo, new electrical drives and a couple of the lifts, and really we already have half of our lifts inspected for winter. So we really have been on that side of it. And that's been the focus for us. Um, with the res travel restrictions and sort of the pandemic hitting, you know, ma our main business in the summer is really, uh, it's this, we have our summer activities, but it's weddings. And almost every one of the weddings that we had here this summer have canceled or postponed to the following year. So that really has impacted our lodging, our food and beverage. And, you know, the facilities just have been empty for that part. So we did, um, we did open our golf course and that has seen great, um, great success. There's been really good member rounds and um, player rounds out there. We're up about 30% year over year, which is really good for us. As golf is not like, it hasn't been like the strongest player for us in the summer. This year it's the only player, so it's the big winner. So um, we've done that and then we've, uh, you know, we did our mountain bike trail maintenance and things like that in the event that we could open up. That didn't pan out for us with uh, sort of the restrictions that we saw in our, so our community and sort of the um, atmosphere that where we live. And, but we did uh, get some cross country trails done and it's been uh, a, an, a busy summer, but not with guests. Well, it's great. And golf really shows that, uh, you know, there's the pent up recreation demand that we know is out there and that certainly bodes well for all the interest we know we'll have for the winter season. And you, you all of you, all of you on the panel and all the resorts across the, the state provide the ultimate outdoor escape for uh, these, these strange times. So thank you, John. Uh, Bill, at Smuggler's Notch, obviously you've got an incredible array of summer activities at Smugs. Uh, tell us a little bit about how that's been going and obviously it's been continuing, I hope. Yeah, we, uh, we do have a big summer program. Uh, because of the issues that you talked about earlier with the travel restrictions, our occupancy this summer was about between 40 and 50 percent of what it has been uh, in the past. But what we learned is no matter what we plan at the beginning of the summer, it's going to look a lot different by the end of the summer. Because the way we guess the way the consumers are going to behave, typically we don't guess correctly. 
A good example of that is we decided that we had to have reservations for the use of our pools. We have a fairly extensive number of pools. Uh, because of the restrictions on the number of people that could be in the, in the pool area at any time. And we found out that if you had a scale of one to 10 on whether that reservation system would be popular with the guests, it came in at around a two. Um, and the, the principal reason for that is that the guests made reservations and then they would uh, be no-shows. So those who couldn't make reservations would walk past the pool and see the pool was half empty and wonder what happened. It was because of the no-shows. So one of the things we learned this summer that you really have to be flexible in uh, whatever you think the services are you're gonna provide. So by the end of the summer, we had figured out that if there was a no-show within 15 or 20 minutes of the point in time, we just opened it up for whoever arrived and that, that did work a lot better. The other thing we learned that we're not sure whether this was actually a latent uh, desire on the part of guests or whether it appeared because of COVID, but we have a lot of activities that are guided. We have an employee that helps the guests through the activity, the guided walks, guided hikes, uh, guided the ball games. And what we learned this summer is that at least our guests made it pretty clear they prefer not to be guided. And they prefer to, you know, kind of organize themselves. We get them to the playing fields. We have maps that show the walks, but they want to go on their own. Um, and that's not so bad when you're doing your personnel planning. But that took place during the course of the summer. And that was another calculation that turned out to be different. So as we think about the winter, we really are thinking that whatever it is that we're planning as our entire industry has specific plans, we better be ready for it the requirement to change it during the course, uh, during the course of the winter. Um, the other thing that I think we all uh, experienced and were concerned about is whether the guests would comply with the protocols that we have in place for the social distancing and uh, for wearing masks. And what we learned is that they watch our employees like hawks. And as long as the employees are complying, the guests feel that they should comply as well. In fact, because our employees were so concerned that the guests would not comply, that we had to set up a system so that the employees could call any one of the officers of the company, or well, actually one of us was, applied, was assigned each day to be the person on duty in the event that a, a uh, employee was concerned that a guest wasn't complying with the protocols, because we definitely did not want our employees to confront the guests. And I can tell you at the end of the summer, there was not one call. So we didn't have to deal with it at all. The guests were very, very compliant. And they, in particular, they would say to us, well, you're wearing masks, so we think we should too. Those were the, the main lessons uh, relative to guests this summer. That's, that's great about the protocols that the guests were following uh, for the safety of obviously your employees and, and everybody, because um, We've obviously heard some mixed bag stories of, across the country as to how uh, yeah. customers and, 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 and other businesses are experiencing the, the, the masking requirements. So that's great to hear. Yeah, there were, well, there was one other thing that we learned that's not new to the people on this call. Uh, we started out by thinking we would tell the guests that they were required to wear masks. Um, I would say that the guest reaction to that was at best neutral. But then we sent a message from the employees asking the guests to please comply to protect their families and the employees were wearing masks to protect the guest families. Would they please do the same? That did work. So asking versus telling uh, had an impact. Great, thank you. And uh, Bill at Vermont Sun Mountain, uh, how was your summer and, and uh, with all the activities you have down there? Well, we, We've had a summer park for quite some time. Uh, we started the Alpine Slide summer 1976. The um, park opened, we opened typically Memorial Day weekend. This year we opened up June 27th, just before the 4th of July. Uh, I would say we opened, we have about 23 attractions, summer attractions, and we opened up about 12 of them. We didn't open them all up that resulted in less employment uh, for the local, the local scene. It's um, mostly high school and uh, college uh, kids that work for us. 
the 4th of July, um, solid weekend. Our fiscal year, interesting enough, Parker starts May 1st. So it's like, how, how do you budget for this, right? So it was a little bit of throwing a dart against the wall. Um, we felt like we would start off July. Are we going to do 50% of normal sales, historical sales? We ramped it up. August is traditionally the bigger summer month. It's the February, if you will, of summer. Uh, we ramped it up a little bit and come to, you know, the two biggest days of summer were, was the Labor Day weekend. Um, it was, it was a nice, solid back-to-back -back days. We're only open weekends now to Columbus Day. I think we have like seven operations, operating days left. Uh, I would say we are 65% of normal to put a percentage on it, or a rough percentage. I, I'm actually pretty pleased where the summer came in, in terms of revenue. And with less attractions open, less payrolls, the clearly the number one cost. Um, to be a little bit in the black is a good thing. And, that, and that's where we are, we are right now. Uh, so cost control, cost control during uh, the situation that we're all in is, is a huge factor. Um, uh, payroll management, cost control, what can you run? What's the cost benefit? Um, all of these things are part of everybody's discussion. Certainly they were in our case. And to just add to what Bill said, um, I, I would say a trend that we saw this summer that we were very pleased with, and there was a lot of hand wringing in the beginning was the, was the business of mask wearing. And it went really well. Um, if you were to ask me, what is my number one surprise about summer? Uh, in, in terms of guests and people visiting Bromley, it was um, how well that went over. We did require masks to enter the park. Um, we didn't message it just quite the same way that Bill did, but it, it was um, very well messaged on our website. And this is something we're going to have to do for winter, how we message the winter. But we all now have some months of operation underneath our belt that will translate very well over to, to the winter scene. And not the least of which was how we message ourselves on our respective websites, social media. Um, so the expectations when they walked in the door, um, and I will say in talking to the guests, um, you know, what, why did you come to Brownlee today and so forth? I, I did get, I did receive comments along the lines of, um, we read your website and it made me feel comfortable. So that was a nice thing. That's fantastic. And, and yeah, and, and so speaking of that, lessons learned for the coming winter, let's jump right into that. Well, you, I've got you in the hot seat, Bill. Uh, can you tell us, you know, I know things are fluid and, and a little preliminary here and there, but what can you share with us tonight as to what will be in the works for the coming winter for operations? Well, I think one of the things um, that we looked hard at is uh, our technology. Um, we are not maybe quite as technologically advanced as um, Mr. Hammond up there at Sugarbush. So we, we invested into a rentals module. We've invested into pickup boxes um, for picking up tickets. Um, these investments are, um, they're going to total six figures when all is said and done. So the idea is to have the guest have as little interaction with, you know, to do things on their own um, at a higher level than maybe they've done in the past. Bromley's always been a very hands-on, almost a throwback ski resort in some of this. And so we've upgraded our technology. We're looking hard at what we're going to do outside. Um, I don't have anything to report right now, but we're looking at outdoor spaces very hard to offset the restrictions inside the base lodges and whatever that will be, like, like we started off with, the plan is in front of ACCD, but we're waiting for approval. And that'll be an umbrella document that we can then, all of us have to design our own individual plans to fall within that. No two skiers are exactly alike. So it's um, keeping the employees safe, keeping the guests safe, developing lift queues, all, all of these things we're all gonna be talking about. Right, right. Any, uh, and so obviously no reservations. That's been sort of a hot point uh, across the various announcements of how skiers are going to be operating. For Bromley, no reservations. 
no, we're going to manage indoor spaces, but I, I really think from the snow line up, uh, skiing is, uh, it's pretty straightforward. You're going to be wearing a mask, you're going to ski, you're going to ride lifts at some, at some number. Um, everything that's good about skiing still, still remains good about skiing. And that's, that's a story in itself. It's, it's a positive story. We're not going to change that. I'm, I'm not, um, I, 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 if anything, and we say this every year, and all of us say it, I hope we have an early snowstorm. <laughs> the ideal, of course. <laughs> and, and you see no restrictions really for the outdoor component. It's really the pinch points of the lodging and, and, and the, basically the warming structures that, that can be the issue. Absolutely. I mean, we're actually, we're talking about gatekeepers, um, managing the dining. In, in our case, and in, I think in most ski resorts, the pinch point is noon. It's the lunchtime. So say 11 o'clock to 1.30 or 11.30 to 1.30, quarter or two. So there will be a time management effort um, that has to happen during those times, whether it's 30 minutes at a table, 40 minutes at a table. It, it will be messaged. Um, it'll be managed. It, it, it'll have to be so that somebody else will have an opportunity to sit at that table. Um, we will certainly allow, um, I know there's a lot of talk about access to restrooms, um, the ability to boot up. Um, we are going to encourage people to boot up in their cars. I'm not going to make it mandatory. I am going to set aside some part of the lodge for people to boot up. It's impractical to think, for me to think, that all our guests are going to boot up in the parking lot. Um, so I'm not going to make it mandatory. It's, it's um, certainly there'll be access to the restrooms. Um, you may not be able to hang out in the base lodge if I'm at max capacity, whatever that is determined to be. And, and I will have people managing the situation. Keep in mind, um, this is about what we call red days. There's about 20 days a year when we're all very busy. Uh, Christmas holidays, weekends, February vacation week. And a given Tuesday in January, I, I don't think any of these management strategies are, are going to be crucial or critical. But on, a, on a December 28th, we're on it. Right. So, yeah, we kind of return to the Chevrolet chalets of the old days for <laughs> warming up back in the car, maybe. <laughs> there, will, there could be some of that. Yeah. <laughs> if the lodge is full, the car is an option. Right, right. And uh, we talked earlier, uh, getting ready for this, you're talking about some touchless ideas for uh, rentals, right? Uh, as people, and, or even getting their, their tickets uh, in advance. Um, with, with, you know, so to cut back on, on even physical uh, interaction with, with folks as they line up. Yeah, those are two areas that we have invested in. Uh, we're also looking at, uh, for the employees, we're looking at time clocks where you don't have to touch them, you announce yourself. And it will also take your temperature and it's all recorded. Um, so, because part of our plan requires that we take the temperature of all our employees. If I have 300 employees or 180 employees on a given day, how do I take everybody's temperature reasonably? So we're investing in time clocks that are touchless, voice announced, and they will also take your temperature automatically. It's automatically recorded to HR and, um, uh, HR would be notified or the super, they both would have an email if an employee announces himself and they exceed 100.4 degrees. Um, we will probably have a second temperature taken with one of the handheld devices to confirm. And then if the employee is allowed to, you know, from there we'll develop protocols on what we're, we can do next. But the Time clocks I'm talking is just another investment in technology that will help us perform our jobs in a safe manner. That's great. That's great. Uh, Bill at Smugs, uh, let's hear what's, uh, what's in store for you and your employees and your guests at Smugs this winter. Well, I like what I hear from Bill, many of the things he's suggesting uh, we, have, we have underway. Uh, when we talk about the, what, we, what we say online with our websites, one of the areas we are really emphasizing is try to come skiing with your friends and family because it's going to be 
easy if you're skiing with people that you know to get on the lifts. Uh, I think the industry standard and certainly our standard will be that anybody who does not wish to ride with others will not have to. Uh, but other than that, we, we're going to accept the word of the people who come online when they say that they're uh, loading the lift with someone that they know. And better still if they've arrived with uh, members of their family or friends. So there'll be a lot of emphasis on that. Uh, we are anticipating that some of our lift line waits in the busy days will be longer than usual. That the loading won't be at the same rate that we've had in the past and we'll be alerting our publics to that possibility uh, before arrival. Uh, Bill talked about the base lodge at noon. You know, all of our uh, RFID technology says that the majority of our skiers and riders arrive at 10 and leave at 2. So it's a four hour window. So we're going to try to educate the public as to that fact and perhaps have those who can schedule their arrival date times differently so that they don't necessarily have to run into the, uh, the crunches that occur during those hours. And once again, it's what, 10 days a year that you really have to be concerned about. And that, uh, that clearly is uh, weekends and holiday weekends, Martin Luther King weekend last year. You'll remember we had a big snowstorm before that weekend. It was quite, it was quite the scene. <laughs> um, the other, other piece of information that might be of interest is we ran a survey of our employees asking them their opinion of working at home versus uh, those who uh, came to work either because we asked them to or they had jobs that required that we couldn't uh, pay the grass cutters to stay home. So they had to come in. But uh, many other jobs, the administrative jobs in particular, and the marketing jobs could be performed at home. And we learned that many can. Uh, but we wanted to know what the employees' attitudes were towards working at home. So we ran a survey of the employees. The bottom line was this. Um, Employees like the idea to work at home, but they very much would like to choose whether or not they work at home. They don't want the company to determine whether they have to work at, on site, and they don't believe that they should determine whether or not they work on site. They want it to be a negotiated schedule between their management and the company. And so that's what we're doing. And we're finding that's, work, that's really working out fine, that the employees are willing to have a discussion on what makes sense for both. Um, so in the, as we go into the future, we will have more employees who are going to spend more, more time at home. We asked them questions about productivity. We didn't ask them whether they like to work at home or not. We asked them if they felt they were productive. We didn't have any employees who said they didn't feel productive at home. <laughs> but, <laughs> but we were surprised because we'd heard these little stories, as we all do, hear little stories on the side of employees thinking some other employees were not being productive at home. But the survey showed that wasn't true. Now, onesie twosie, sure. But most employees said that their experience working with others had been that uh, the people that they know uh, are as productive at home as they possibly could be. The one loss, though, that everybody felt, and I would suspect that John and Bill uh, feel the same, they felt a loss of uh, creativity because of the, the interactions that no longer take place, you know, walking in the hallways or meeting over lunch or where you're discussing issues uh, that uh, are best resolved uh, when you uh, walk in and meet an employee casually rather than on a Zoom call when you try to resolve things. So we haven't figured out how to address that creativity issue, but that was the only real, real negative that we faced. So that was, that was a few other lessons from the summer. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and for the, the, obviously, management, managing the winter traffic, uh, obviously, with, whether it's lift tickets or season passes, um, what's, what's the plan with that? Uh, reservations? Um, no, we, we, like others, like Bill, I think the day after the reservation systems were announced, we announced we we're not going to have reservations. Now, we all are going to have to have systems that take care of those days when there are uh, more people who want to get on the lifts than we can comfortably handle. And we'll, uh, we'll have to deal with that. But uh, our attitude is that we're not gonna have reservations. And furthermore, that we're not gonna send people home. That whatever our systems are, 
if, uh, if we're unable to take care of your need right at this moment, we'll find a way to take care of it without having to send you home. Great, great. And uh, the queue for, for your chair lifts, um, obviously the plans will be for distancing for and, for and back and side by side and, and all that. And people naturally wearing masks outside anyway, which takes care of a lot of, a lot of issues. Yeah, well, we're, um, as everyone knows, we're very fortunate to have all doubles. So uh, it's pretty easy for us. You just have to know one person to be able to ride on our list. Right. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, I think Matt over Glenn will be the most compliant ski area in the country this winter. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't heard, maybe John or Bill, no, I haven't heard the solution to triples. I need to load a triple 50%. <laughs> I haven't heard. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, so speaking of Matt River Glen, we'll move over to their neighbor, John, at Sugarbush. Uh, can you share with us uh, your winter operations? And I think this is the first full winter where you'll be entirely on the Icon Pass, I believe is the, another interesting dynamic for you to deal with as here <laughs> in your new position. <laughs> exactly. So just save the follow-up question. We will not be doing reservations either. <laughs> There we go. Uh, um, and really, we're looking at that as we're going to be managing uh, the number of day tickets that we sell. And we're going to be putting all of our tickets online for advanced purchase. And that way, you know, we, we joke, Kevin Babick, our chief uh, administrative officer, you know, he's got spreadsheets for years about skier visits. And he, every week he gives out a skier <laughs> forecast. And every week we joke with him, like, really, you were 30 days off? five days out, you know, what are you, what are you doing? You're really slipping. So he, he's really sharp on our forecasting. So we feel pretty confident that by allowing all of our pass holders unrestricted access, except for what's the, their pass restricts them, that we can manage the crowds that will make it a good experience on the mountain by limiting day tickets. And that's, so that's really our, our plan. Obviously with ICON and sort of some of the changes in our structure, we have to uh, give Kevin a little extra variable to account for, but um, you know I think that's that's for us is the plan. You know, similar to Bill, uh, the Bills, we'll be uh, you know moving stuff outside. Uh, we've purchased a, a food truck, and we're doing some takeout windows. We're going to be doing um, a lot of online ordering for everything to sort of eliminate queuing. So you know you can order your food from the cafeteria, pick it up get a table, you know, A or B. We'll do advanced reservations for ski school, for rentals, same thing. So what we don't want to do is put 200 people in the rental shop. We want to get your reservations ahead of time, get your gear set up for you. We'll text you when your stuff's ready to get picked up. We'll walk you through in small groups as we go through it. That way you can, you're not, you're not wasting your day waiting in line. You can, you know, get out be, be outside, enjoy the resort, see what's going on. And then when it's time to get your gear, you can come up and get it. And that's, that's you know, to us, you know, I think you, Bill was talking about sort of the, the, uh, the high touch and sort of guest experience that we all sort of work on here in Vermont and that's, that we're known for. And it's, it's really difficult for a lot of us to give up that, that um, communication that we have with the guests and do it all online and have this sort of, distance relationship with the customer. So we're working on it and trying to make sure that people are still going to realize they're in Vermont and that, you know, we're still the same people here. We just have a little different policy and procedure to get through the day. Tell us a little about the, uh, the, the pool cabana model you might be following this winter. I love this. <laughs> yeah. So um, we, we realized that like everyone, the base area is our pinch point. So while well, we're, batting around ideas of how to do it. And it's like, wouldn't it be great if you could have your own little base lodge? So yes, that's what we're gonna do. We're building six little mini personal cabins. We're gonna call them, you know, the Sugarbush Base Camps, or I don't know what we're gonna call them yet, but that's the number, the names that we've been saying here. And so, you know, you can rent your own little building right in the base lodge or in the base area. So your family or a group that's in your cohort or bubble can rent this, that can be your home base. That could be where you boot up in the morning. That, that sort of, that was our sort of reasonable alternative. You know, the only bummer is, you know, I think we're uh, gonna get about six of them built before uh, the season starts. And back when we priced these out in June, you know, lumber prices were what, you know, 60% of what they are right now. So it's, uh, 
we're going along on that model, but it should be exciting. And, uh, you know, we're looking forward to having a little something personal and exciting to have for the guests. That's great. Um, one thing I, I should have touched on uh, with, with the other bills, and I didn't, and I will come back to them on this, is uh, ski school. What, any concrete change in plans at this point? I mean, I'm sure it'll be different, but what's, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, um, so we, we'll be putting a release out to all of our seasonal program members on Monday. So I don't want to, you know, muddy the waters, but we did um, cancel all of our seasonal programs. We just didn't feel comfortable at Sugarbush saying that we're the ones grouping the customers together. You know, with a lot, like you said, you know, 80% of the customers coming from outside Vermont, we just, you know, we didn't know, we didn't want to be the person that said, you two have to be together in a group. So um, what we did is we're going to be offering a hybrid program to seasonals. The details of that will be coming out next week. But um, by doing everything online ahead of time for the other, we're basically just doing privates. Um, we're going to be able to get the health information that the people are complying by the ACCD guidelines for travel. All of that sort of information we'll be getting ahead of time. And then again, they won't be waiting in your, in your line for your ski instructor to do, to register for a lesson. It should be all taken care of. Great. And uh, at Smugs and Bromley, uh, obviously with your family programs at those mountains, uh, any plan changes for the ski school uh, situation? And we are, we're going to continue the ski school program to the extent that we can. The major change is going to be that for many of our uh, ski school programs, we're going to ask a parent to accompany the child. So we have a lot of experience with the mom and me and dad and me kind of teaching. So we will have uh, programs available, uh, but with the, the parent accompanying the child. Not in all cases. The requirement won't be there in all cases. It'll be kind of age related. We did drop our seasonal uh, program that we've run for many years for three and four year olds, for example. So those programs now started at age five. But even in those programs, we're asking the mom or the dad to be present. So that any handling of the child will be the parent rather than an instructor. It's been pretty popular as an optional program. It's just not going to be optional anymore. It'll be part of the what's built in. But the ski school, other than that, uh, all of the traditional programs will be run with that extra support. We do plan to experiment uh, with a, I don't like what they call this, it sounds like, um, a supermarket, but they call it drop and go. <laughs> what a way to talk about your child. You know? <laughs> anyway, a parent can come, a child is designated, obviously being healthy and being able to take care of themselves uh, on snow. In other words, they can, if they fall and the ski comes off, they can put it back on themselves, they can get up. So we can keep the social distancing and the instructors don't have to uh, handle the child. We're going to experiment with that. Um, but even that program will require that the parent be within 10 minutes of the uh, location where we're doing the teaching. So if the child is unable to take care of themselves appropriately, the parents can come and either join them or pick them up. So a lot of changes, but always trying to figure out how we can keep those kids on snow so they'll love it for a lifetime. Absolutely. That's great. And Dana Bromley, I'm sure you're dealing with a lot of the same issues, Bill, right? We are. And I think uh, in, in our case, we have um, what we call a kid center. And the kid center is for very young children up to age five. And I don't see us running that program at all. Um, I'm going to use that space uh, as a area for the employees uh, to have dining where they can have their lunch. So as far as the employees go, they would have a safe place to eat that is not in the base lodge. They can go to the base lodge, get their hamburger and their Pepsi, whatever they're going to have for lunch, leave the lodge, and then they would go to the kids center. So we repurposed, as both John and Bill are talking about, we're re-engineering the ski experience. And I'm re-engineering some of our spaces because it's uh, what's the highest and best use of this space is something we've been talking about quite a bit. Uh, I, I think, um, so having a space for, for all the patrol and ski school and lift attendants to go to have lunch um, is, is been um, help, helped contribute to the demise of 
I, I just am not exactly sure how I bundle children together from different counties from out of state. And I just, this has probably been the topic we have wrestled with the most. Um, I, I would love to hear what John's hybrid model is. So I'll be reading the newspaper, John. Um, because I, I think sharing information and trying to figure this out is, 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 a, is quite a feat. And we have to be careful. Skiing is meant to be fun. And um, we have to be careful that we don't have a Soviet gulag style ski experience. And I don't want to sit around and say, no, no, no. Um, so we have to balance this and we have to make sure that skiing this year is as much fun as it ever is. It may just look a little different. So with that, how does that translate to snow sports? Um, right now we're leaning heavily to privates, um, privates, family privates, ski, arrive together. Maybe we can ski together uh, as a group. Um, so we're still, I, I can't answer your question with complete authority, Parker, um, at this very point in time, but it's front and center and it's, it, it's one of the number one things we're wrestling with. Absolutely. Um, I, I, I'd just like to add what Bill said, I think it's important. This is a, a moment in time when uh, it would be advantageous for everyone uh, in our industry to share ideas. And I know, I know most of the ski school managers have in fact been doing that, talking to each other either formally or informally, but that's very important for us to share ideas, to try to crack through because the, ultimately the objective is to make sure that our publics are happy with our sport. No question. I, I think I, I can't think of an industry more cooperative at the state or national level than the ski industry in terms of sharing information with each other. As much as you compete with each other, uh, as, as hard as anybody would, it's the, the, the information sharing uh, has, has always uh, been so impressive. And so I know that will be um, even even more critical and, and uh, timely this, this season with all these, these challenges. Um, we had a, some of the questions coming in from the audience. Um, well, one we, we, John Hammond and I knew we probably would hear is uh, any changes now that we know backcountry skinning will probably explode even more in popularity, uh, any changes at, at SMUGS uh, with your uphill policy or any adjustments to that? It's not an issue that we've dwelled on. Uh, at SMUGS, we're still trying to figure out the right thing to do at the moment. It, we would probably say that uh, what we were doing last year is what we'll do this year, but I can't, you can't hold me to it because we don't have a firm policy at this point. Sure. And uh, John at Sugarbush, any changes there? No, we're going to go with the same policy as we had uh, last year. Um, we have been exploring different options, um, but really, you know, the key for us is the safety of the guests and the employees. And with our narrow New England trails that are, going up and down, but people sometimes go down a little faster. We want to make sure we're avoiding any conflicts. So um, for right now, that's the, that's the case. No change. Absolutely. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, and Bromley, any changes there? No, this is, a, this is a great question because it is definitely, it's, it's, it's the one part of our sport that trends, that equipment is trending up. Um, it's going to certainly be trending up this year. Uh, we will probably follow through with the same plan that we've had, but I reserve the right right to react to um, how it how it unfolds. Put it that way. Most of the crowd that skins is a well behaved, follow the rules crowd, and and you know we're in this together. Um, I have to partner with everybody, and I'm going to need to partner with the uphill crowd as much as I partner with the downhill crowd. Right. And while I have you, Bill, any. Any changes or different approaches to ski patrol? Ski patrol, in, you know, they certainly don't have a palace on top of the mountain. Um, I, I <laughs> so it has a capacity limit. Um, the first aid room certainly has a capacity limit. Um, so re going back to my kid center, um, your, the patrol certainly will be on top. They'll be out doing their checks out on the trails and then they would have this space this it's almost the space that I am talking about the kid center space being repurposed almost acts like an accordion where it can 
uh, uh, take in employees, take in. So if I have a patrolman that has needs a place to go, um, because it's so different this year and we're re-engineering this, this is how we're going to handle it. Other than that, we're following NSP guidelines, um, PPE. Um, um, it, you know, one of the nice, um, there's a rhythm to the ski business. And one of the nice rhythms that I've always enjoyed is the refresher weekend that, you know, it usually comes up in October. It's great to see everybody. You know, it's a great dedicated, dedicated crew that we all have. They work very hard. They put a lot into this. And um, we all love our respective patrols. Um, so keeping them safe, providing them with the safe equipment. Um, it's going to be weird not having, um, holding, hosting a refresher course. Everything is online these days. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> exactly. Um, so anyways, I, I, I don't know really what, what, what more I can add. We will be following recommendations from headquarters, National Ski Patrol, and, and then uh, watching out for each other. Absolutely. John, up at Sugarbush, what's uh, anything different for Ski Patrol you anticipate? Yeah, I mean, right now we're still trying to figure out if um, University Medical Center is going to be operating a clinic in our base lodge, you know, at the first aid room. Um, you know, we're still trying to figure that part of it out. I think that, you know, we've got some pretty savvy patrollers like uh, the other bills have, all of the, all of the uh, scariest do, that know how to do this job safely and you know how to protect. You know, rule one is protecting themselves first and then helping the guest. So, you know, I think that's the lens we're going to be looking through. How do we do this? And, you know, there's going to be some extra steps. There might be a lot more outside the clinic treatment is what we've talked about. Um, you know, I think that we'll be looking at, uh, you know, th there is some changes to, to what we're going to do. And, and Colin, our patrol director, has been uh, working on that. He sent out his uh, first uh, warning shot email to all the patrol today. So... I think we're going to be, uh, we'll see some changes, but I mean, the level of care that the patrollers give in Vermont is not going to change. It's just the, where they're going to be doing it. Yeah, I agree with that. We're not, I'm not overly uh, focused on figuring out what's right for the patrol because like John and Bill, our patrols are uh, not quiet when they have issues that they would like us to deal with. And I'm sure that uh, they'll help us understand the right thing to do. And that's what we'll end up, uh, that's what we'll end up doing. Good. Okay. You know, Parker, I want to just add one more thing on the patrol. Sure. Um, I, I view them as essential employees. Um, it, it requires a great deal of dedication, skill. They're handling sleds. They do perform lift evacs. Um, so I, I look at them as a critical piece for us to safely open. Um, and many of my patrolmen come from red and yellow counties. Um, both paid and volunteer. So I look at them as essential. I, I just want to get that out there. I, um, I think they're very important in the methodology to classify who's essential and who isn't essential is, is an important question. Um, and it's just something we have to keep. That's very good. To me, I think this is just something we have to keep right in front of us. We may want to bring that to, uh, to Molly for the VSAA to take a unified position. Yeah. Absolutely. It's in the plan. <laughs> there you go. All right. <laughs> uh, another question for the audience. What about racing programs? Any, uh, start with you, John. Um, any, any plans on that one way or the other? Well, um, there's, you know, it's a great activity to do. You're not competing with another person, you're competing against yourself for the time. So uh, talk about socially distant, it works out perfectly. And I think, um, you know, what the, where we're gonna see a constraint is on weekends and trying to do some of the races that, um, for the younger kids, but for like NASTAR, we'll plan on running that as early and often as possible. Um, we have the great relationship with the Green Mountain Valley School. And, you know, we've already had, well, one formal meeting and 50 other informal meetings with them about how we're going to try to operate with the club and the academy. And, you know, I think 
really what we're going to be talking about almost all the time is these peak days that we're, we have constraints and it's the holidays and the weekends. And, you know, come to, on a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, it, it might seem like normal skiing when you come to the resort. You know, maybe there'll be a few more kids because of remote learning, but, you know, I, I don't anticipate middle of the week being as big of a, big of a change for us. And so that's the time that we're really looking to focus on sort of the um, ski events, things like that. But there are, there are restrictions that you can't have more than 100 participants. There, you know, there's some different boxes that are being set up um, through Vera and through FIS and USSA. And, you know, obviously all of us are, you know, trying to keep up with all of the guidelines that we need to stick, you know, stick within from the governor's guidelines to these uh, event uh, promoters as well. So. And, uh, yeah, and at Smugs, at Bill, anything there for uh, race programs? Pretty much what uh, John said. I would just add that we we do have uh, non-racing clubs that we have traditionally been able to to uh, accommodate, and we have had to turn some of them away who, who come with large or large numbers on Saturdays and try to uh, figure out another way to handle them. Uh, Lamoille County has got Wednesdays uh, where the kids are going to be home, so we're wondering if we can direct some of that club activity to uh, to Wednesdays, but we're working working with them trying to resolve the issue, but that will be a change than what we've been able to do in the past. But other than that, for, in terms of the, the our race club, uh, we're gonna also continue that activity. Got it, okay. And, and Bill, while I have you, um, as you were obviously talking about the busy summer you had and guests complying with masks and all that in a very positive way, and you and I had spoken earlier before this event about how you deal with out-of-state guests, you know they're coming from hot zones or you, 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 you may suspect, but the screening process is, is essentially self-certifying, but tell us a little bit of how that went this summer and, and how you would be dealing with that this winter. That was a major, major issue among the employees. We yeah. had to decide exactly how we were gonna handle it. And there are two, two instances. One is when the, the guests arrive and they sign the compliance form, we're, we're simply gonna believe them. Uh, realistically, we know that we have some, maybe more than some, will sign the form just so that they can vacation the way they'd like to vacation. So our emphasis, just as John and Bill, our emphasis has been on compliance when they are staying with us. So we're, we're not going to try to find out whether or not they told the truth on the forms. What we are going to do is make sure that they're complying with all the correct protocols while they are with us. And that seems to have, uh, that seems to have worked out. You know, plus, the, the second, I said there are two possibilities. The second possibility is that we have had one or two this summer who said, I didn't quarantine, but I'm going to sign this form anyway. And uh, that's not acceptable. And so when that happens, then the, uh, the person at our guest service desk is instructed to allow them to check in and then let an officer of the company know, and we will uh, we'll work with them to uh, to work it out so that they will probably end up leaving the resort. Mm -hmm. But we don't ask our employees to confront the guests. Right, yeah. I, I just want to mention that, you know, on the compliance side and the enforcement side, there's a lot of people that have never, they just never left since March 14th. You know, there's their plates might be white, but they're uh, a local Valley resident, just like the rest of us. And, you know, it's really hard to judge or be put in the position to make the, you know, to make the decision of telling if someone's telling the truth or not. So we really have to you count can't. on the personal accountability of the skiers. You know, we know that in general, skiers are good people. And that's why, that's why we're all here. And that's why we stuck doing this job. <laughs> and focus on making sure that they're doing the right thing while they're here. Exactly. Or not, they did the right thing in, in signing the compliance form. Yeah. And it, you know, this is a shared, it, this comes back to the shared responsibility, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's summer or winter. It's, it's a shared responsibility. The NSAA has come out with the slogan, uh, it, I think it goes along the lines, don't be the reason we lose our season. Um, I'm going to trust, if you're standing in front of my ticket office, that you know the rules, that you, I have messaged you, you, have, you, have, you know it's a COVID, it's a pandemic winter and that I am going to trust that you have done your 
your responsibility, your, your obligation. I'm doing the best we can as operators. We're all doing the best we can as operators, but it's a partnership. And, and um, I, I really don't know much, what more to add, um, but it's impractical to think I'm going to ask everybody coming up the sidewalk from the parking lot, where are you from? Yeah. I, it's, it's Just the, the message that we're all in this together, I think, is the... Yeah, uh, the exactly. Right. I will mention also on the accountability side and back to summer, um, our IT department right off the bat developed uh, an email that goes out to all of our active staff. And in that email, before they come to work, they need to check that they're going to be on site, if they're going to be on site, that they're complying by the the guidelines that we all have to ask in our health questionnaires and you know to the other two other guys out there that's been really effective for us and it's been really really well received from the employees so and it also it also gives us assurance that you know people are following the rules and they understand every day it's a front of the before they come to work they have to check this box you know check check in that they're doing this so it's good excellent so we, we had, did have a, a pretty good question from one of the audience members, wanting to know about portable space heaters and grills in the parking lot for those Chevrolet chalets for warming up the back of your car. Um, any thoughts or, I mean, this, may, this might be pretty far out in terms of planning, but I, sort of like the way the last season ended, that became an issue that shut down resorts that had already been closed for the season from even allowing up, uphill uh, capacity uh, with, with the lifts not running anymore. Uh, how much thought has, has this come into your planning uh, for you, you three folks on kind of, I guess, the tailgating dynamic for the warming hut by the car? <laughs> I like that the question came from Beach. So, yeah, well, I wasn't going to call him out, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, so, in uh, this month's uh, Scary Management Magazine, there's actually an article just exactly about that. Um, about how, you know, some interesting ideas and concepts to do the pods where people can sort of have as their home bases. You know, we've discussed that and, you know, we're trying to see, you know, we're going to be limiting the number of people that are coming to the resort, which means that on a normal day, we're going to actually have more parking spots than we normally would. So um, one of the thoughts was, you know, do we put the food truck actually down closer to the parking lot than, than to the ski lift? And some things like that. So we, we are looking at that. And uh, Beach, we're thinking about you. <laughs> Make sure you set up. Now, if Beach finds his way to Smugs or Bromley, what any thoughts with you guys? <laughs> our, our parking lot is pretty windswept. I I think um, you know the business of brown bagging. Um, I, I, I think everything's on the table. Um, would I, would I discourage it? If they, if people can do it in a responsible manner, have at it. Um, yeah. That I may be asking you to go back down to your car to warm up. So what's fair is fair. It's, uh, um, if the base lodge is restricted, um, you got to go somewhere. And uh, so there's a logic to this that, and a fairness. And so. I, I think it, I, I don't want you to burn down the um, nice car next to you. Um, so we, we would manage it. We, you know, we certainly have staff out there. And, um, and, and as John says, there's probably going to be room. Yeah, we, I have not been involved in that discussion yet. Many, many discussions, but not that one. But now I know the answer after listening to you. <laughs> yeah. I've, Bill, I've observed many a fine grill set up in your parking lot. Uh, the upper <laughs> one, I'm always get myself to. So I'm sure that tradition will continue. <laughs> um, another thing we actually didn't touch on is I guess one of the silver linings, uh, maybe pleasant surprises coming out of this crazy state of affairs is the uh, inclination to midweek business that's always so so empty and not full. We've got kids uh, with flexible school schedules, two days in, two days out, folks still remote working. Are you seeing with your guests uh, chatter and, and, and in inquiries about, um, you know, an increase in, in midweek business that we're always trying to fill as opposed to the, the, the heavy weekends? In our case, Parker, we have 300 units in Bromley Village. And typically 
um, uh, summer. They'll come up occasionally to visit. To John's point early, that he made earlier, when March came, I have over 100 families that stayed all summer long. Um, they never left. So it, it, it was really remarkable and un, unanticipated um, in the hubbub that was spring. And we looked around in May and it was like, you know, we got over 100 families still up here. And I'm like, really? So it, it was quite an eye opener. And could it lead to some more midweek business? I certainly hope so. Um, the opportunity is there and it would be um, the way to go. I don't really anticipate much change midweek. Um, there's going to be plenty of capacity for everybody. We are, we're hearing about more and more homeschooling, so that may affect the midweek business as well. Yeah. So the, the other piece to the, um, to, with the homeschooling is the college students that we're seeing is we're actually getting quite a few college students applying for jobs, especially for the, um, for snowmaking early season. Since a lot of them are on remote learning and they're seeing that they, you know, right now it's their future is sort of up in the air till the end of January, which works out perfectly for snowmaking. Um, so we are seeing that. And, you know, with the J1s, I know that we brought in, you know, 10 years ago, we didn't bring in any J1s. And last year we brought in over 100 because we just couldn't staff um, the mountain. And we're, see, we're feeling pretty optimistic about the job, uh, Mark, or at least the applications we're seeing coming in already. So hopefully that's a, a positive that, you know, we can employ some Vermonters here and uh, get people to work locally. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Bill and Bill, I think, yeah, you've got some, some good college populations to tap into for possible staffing as they do a, do a deferral year. We certainly hope so because internationals are going to be rather scarce this uh, this winter, right? Unless that unless that changes, you know, I think the the winter break is going to be unusually long. Uh, it's going to yeah. afford us an opportunity to staff pretty well from maybe Thanksgiving to sometime deep into January. Uh, we may be scrambling all of us a little bit and towards the last six or eight weeks of uh, winter, but. The heart of winter, the Christmas week, I have pretty high hopes that um, kids are going to be home early, Thanksgiving-ish, and I don't think they're going to go back till late, and that's going to have to offset the loss of J1s because we're, we're not going, we're not going to have any J1s. Right. Parker, I see there are a number of questions about how we will be, I guess the word is treating those who have a special uh, requirements of, that their physicians have, have said that they should not be wearing masks or other issues that they are dealing with and how we will manage that. Yeah, there is a thread of questions along those lines. Is that anything? I, think uh, we're all, I mean, we're all in absolute agreement that all comers are welcome to uh, use our facilities and uh, they people who uh, have physical conditions that don't allow them to wear masks. We may ask that them that they ride the lift without others, but certainly they're going to have uh, absolute access. They're more than welcome to uh, enjoy the sport that smugglers and my guess is at the other areas as well. Right. And that's addressed in the governor's um, guidelines. So I think yeah. you know, it's important that we, we follow the guidelines and, you know, and that's clearly spelled out. So Maybe exactly that answers the question. Yeah, and yeah, and Bill, I'm sure you have the same thoughts. I mean, it's it's really common sense, and it it's it's guidance. It's legal guidance that we've been working with and dealing with already. And that was the case over the summer, and we had a few instances. Yeah. They explained it. Uh, the The summer experience is going to prove to be. Uh, there's a, another level of confidence um, amongst my staff as we go to winter, now that they've had a summer under their belt. Um, there was a, a level of worry. Let's say, we, like I said, we opened June 27th. How are these first few weeks going to go? Which has led to a more of a we got this kind of approach amongst the staff as we look at summer, or at, at, at winter. And we're doing our winter planning because all of us have to come up now with our own individual plans as we talked earlier. And those conversations are completely different 
and cut to the chase much quicker than when we were trying to plan for summer. So there's been an evolution and in, in, in I think a little bit of confidence with, with, the, whole pro, with the whole process. Not saying we have all the answers, Parker. No. I'm just saying <laughs> but experience is breeding some confidence that we can pull this off and pull it right. off. Yeah, I mean, this is a, a work in progress, as we know. And right. uh, you know more now than you knew back in April or May, but you'll know a lot more certainly by the time the snow falls. Hopefully, we can hope for some relaxing of the travel restrictions by November. I know, Bill, you've, you've indicated that would be a great help for knowing whether you're coming or going on some of your recreational seasonal programs. Um, and yeah, that's just, a, there's a lot uh, that goes into those, those restrictions that we do hope will be loosened in a safe way. That's, pr you know, priority number one. Um, but I know that's, everybody's working on that, so. <laughs> so again, on the midweek business and sort of possibility of increased recreation, I see there's another comment about hiking and biking and I know that the Madden River Riders just completed the study, or the planning district completed a study of the trails month over month, same time period, same, same trails. And we saw an increase of 30% in ridership um, over the summer. And you can't buy a cross country mountain bike right now. So that's a good, or, or any bike. So that's a good indication that people are hopefully getting out there and recreating. And you know, I think, you know, we would all love to see a little bit of a busier midweek. Um, you know, a, a, a more steady business flow as opposed to the, the just peak on the weekends. And, you know, I think that's going to be good for everyone if that does happen. Absolutely. Okay, questions just come, keep coming in. There, there's quite a variety here. I mean, I, I know this is something that, I mean, we're, we're going to get really into the weeds here and something I've been wrestling with, and I'm sure you have as workers comp in the world of COVID. Um, I'm sure you guys have been talking about it and, I don't know what guidance we've gotten from the, the state on this or, or what and any uh, any any magic uh, <laughs> words out there, John. I'm going to let the lawyer wife handle that one. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I think we all have to do that, but uh, it's the same solution that we have for workers' comp and any other kind of issue, and that is you just go out, got to go out of your way to keep the employees safe under all circumstances, and that's the way to beat the workers' comp. We'll also, we will be helped uh, a lot by the, uh, by the tracing. And Vermont's very good at tracing. So that at least we can be assured if an employee does uh, come down with COVID, that we will be able to determine through the tracing whether or not they actually contracted the disease while working. Yeah. I did read uh, probably three months back, there was some uh, guidance on that from the state. Since it was three months ago, I don't want to dare try to repeat it, but it is, it, there is guidance out there on, on COVID exposure and what the obligations are of the employee so, or the employer. So, yeah. So, and I know we had, we had one, uh, one caller already looking ahead to Reggae Fest in the spring and wondering how uh, events will be impacted. Of course, we do have size restrictions, as you mentioned with racing, John. Um, I'm sure the event restrictions are going as part of your playbook as you, you work on this every day. Uh, any initial thoughts on that? Or are we, are we gonna have your, your pond skimming contests? <laughs> well, we're, we're uh, hold, holding out hope that uh, we will have pond skimming. It hurt not to do it this year. So, yeah. um, you know, there's some outdoor activities and, and events that we feel that can still happen. You know, really what we're trying to do is avoid inside congregated groups of people. So. You know, we're looking at can we change some of the events to be more programming where it's, you know, smaller groups and reservations for 10 people that know each other to do an, a small event and things like that, as opposed to some of the, the really fun things that, you know, we've all been doing for years. So, yeah, again, it'll be different, but we're, we're not throwing out the, uh, the liners for the pond skimming. So we're going to hold on to those still. Excellent. <laughs> How about Bill at Smugs? You've, you've got a pretty good pond skimming situation there. Yeah, we do. But you know, you can, because it's outdoors, you can still uh, socially distance. Right. And if you get, if you get compliance by the spectators, um, I think it's doable. Yeah. Yeah. And Bromley, I'm sure you're, 
working on this as we speak. Yeah, I, I think the event list is going to look different. You, you know, you, you try and have some kind of event every weekend. It's, uh, it, it's, it's in the works. It, it, as I said earlier, I, I don't want to sit here and say, no, no, no. That's just not going to. The idea is to still have a fun winter. And, and what is that? Um, it's to be determined in some respects. I, I, you know, we have an outdoor deck. We have a really nice outdoor deck. I'm trying to figure out how I can make that deck a 12 month uh, experience um, as opposed to just the summer. So there's a, there's a bunch of ideas. Um, they do require investments, um, but expanding our spaces, having some level of events, um, and we're still skiing it is, it, you know, a lot of this is going to be somewhat along the lines of arrive, ski, and leave. There is that aspect to this winter. And, and I think a lot of people will follow that. Um, but there are those that um, really like the social aspect of skiing. So what are the social aspects of skiing that we can do that is safe for everybody? And, and that's a, a hot topic. Absolutely. Uh, another hot topic, of course, is childcare. The states made it difficult enough, even pre-COVID. Uh, what are your thoughts on that, Bill, uh, for childcare plans? Um, my we, oh, go ahead, or Bill. any either Bill or both. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I, I would say that that is one of the more intense, ongoing discussions at the moment, whether or not we'll offer childcare for the kids six months to uh, three years. And there's not agreement in our organization on that subject at the moment. I am relatively determined to make sure if we don't offer it that we really have great reasons for not. We do take care of employee children now. Um, I think some other areas are taking care of children from Vermont. Um, I have a hard time, frankly, understanding the difference between a child from Brattleboro and a child across the border in, uh, in New Hampshire. I don't understand what the difference is. Um, but it's, un it's unresolved, but we're gonna, we are gonna try to figure out a way to take care of younger kids so that their parents can enjoy the sport. We certainly have a child care experience in Vermont where younger kids are being cared for in the school system. So we think that the, the real issue is whether or not caregivers are willing to take care of kids who don't come from Vermont and try to get that resolved. Great. John, how about at Sugarbush? How's it going with that? So we did re reopen our reoccurring daycare. So basically the kids that are enrolled um, month to month. So it's really, it's the local kids, the local families. And some of those locals have white plates because they've been here and become locals. But, um, but we, as of right now, we're not planning, um, it's not in our, well, it's in our plan, but we're not planning right now to do it, to open up the, um, for regular just walk-in guests. You know, it's, it's something that, you know, will be, you know, it'll be plan seven in the daycare uh, world, but, or probably 407, but as of right now, we're just doing the, the, reoccur the reoccurring children. And at Bromley? Yeah, that's the space, Parker. We're, we're as much as I, I'm chagrined to say this because we're known for families. Um, and it's important, as Bill said, you know, start them young. As much um, as we, I'm chagrined to say, we're not going to offer it. And I'm going to take that space, as I mentioned earlier in this conversation, and repurpose it mm -hmm. as, as a spot for my employees to. Um, eat, eat lunch and, and, and so forth. Um, so that they're not in the base lodge. Um, so it's going to serve a great purpose. It's for one year and I feel bad about this. And it's just, these are the kind of decisions we were faced with and we have to make. And I, I don't know how we can do it and meet the guidelines um, is really the bottom line. Right. No, that's, it's just another huge challenge uh, to, making the season as normal as possible when it's just, it's just not going to be, as we know. But you all are doing great work and pulling the plans together and complying, in compliance, and then making the experience as good as possible, obviously, for the guests, and as safe as possible. That's priority number one. We know that.
think uh, we've covered pretty much all the questions, I believe. Um, I can answer the busing question, which is really well, yeah, I did see the very specific <laughs> slide, Brooke. It's inquiry, so sure. That's, that's all. <laughs> well, that's going to be the same answer for uh, across the state, where they basically opened up the guidelines to 75% capacity. So that's what the capacity of uh, public transportation is right now for, for enclosed uh, buses. So right. okay. that, that's what we'll be running with. Uh, you know, a month ago, it was only 50%. So we'll see what it looks like in November. Yeah. But it also could provide a great skinning opportunity for those skinners that want to get a little exercise. They That's can uh, skin back to the ski resort. That's a good point, you know. And <laughs> use that instead of the bus. Better for climate change. Better for everything. <laughs> um, I mean, there's some general inquiries about We won't. The type the, of mask. The face mask as a whole, it does, it's not a face mask. Next. <laughs> right. I mean, you guys are going to be dealing with so many issues, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, it's so little that you can control, a spike in cases, you know, you might have to reconcile that. Uh, folks showing up just as you can't really screen, you know, name, rank, and, social, and security number for where they're exactly from when they self-certify. You just have to deal with masks on a common sense, case-by-case -case basis, I guess, right? I mean, it's... And, and that's part of, for, I mean, not the mask part, but for us for tracing, and essentially by not having an anonymous ticket, by pay, making people reserve in advance, you now know who that person is. So you know when they went through the gate, so you can figure out who was around them on, on the chair. You know, so it does, there is some information that would be, that is helpful for the contact tracing and for, you know, comf peace of mind for people. Right. Same for you, uh, Bill and Bill. Yeah, we're not going to do what they're doing in the NFL and finding the coaches $100,000 if the mask slips down on their face. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was <laughs> pretty harsh, but. <laughs> but, uh, Parker, I'm sure that Bill and John joined with me in thanking you for setting up this opportunity to talk to the public about what our coming winter is going to look like. Well, and I can't thank you enough on behalf of the museum for participating in this, this panel. It's a, a great discussion to have. And obviously, as everybody knows, they gather from this discussion, as you all know, of course, it's continues to be fluid, but just think how far you've come in the last several months and how much more clarity we will have before the snow even flies and hopefully clarity from the state on the DSAA plan, which hopefully will be soon. And of course, we'll all be hoping for some reasonable and safe relaxing of the quarantine restrictions for our, our core markets um, to get them here in the numbers that we want and provide the best possible winter in these strange times because you all provide the ultimate antidote, fresh air antidote and plenty of space as once get past the pinch points for the ultimate release of outdoor winter recreation and in, in, uh, just what people need. Uh, you you know, Parker, I, I think, um... The concentration in Vermont has been to get the schools open. And, and they've done a great job, colleges, high schools. Um, they've done a really good job. So uh, to the point where I think fall sports, high school sports start tomorrow. Um, I think the, the, the states really looked at that very hard. Next up, the bat is foliage season. So the governor opened up lodging to 100%. We'll see you know who can come here. But um, the idea is that that's the next big thing that faces us as a state. After that, the ski season is in the hopper. We're up the bat. And we were, the, we were shut down in March. Our turn in the batting order is coming up. And we're only a couple of months out. And there's some big decisions that need to be made um, for sure. And we're right on the cusp. And let's see. And quite frankly, I, I think historically, and you may know this, Parker, better than anybody, Foliage season may see the most people in Vermont over as a concentrated time period than any other season in Vermont. Is that is? Do I have that right? It's it's the short. It's the most concentrated for the the duration of its of its season. It's the shortest, uh, shortest of the three major seasons. Right. Winter is still the the top uh, revenue generator. We actually do see more people in summer, but fall is close, and it would be 
much more if, if fall if the fall season were you know longer than really just being a month and a half essentially um compared to summer and winter um though summer sometimes only feels like about two weeks long but right. but, but no but things have gone well you know through this weekend yeah. yeah but yeah no uh, fall foliage that's essentially one third of the tourism picture in, in, in rough numbers is huge especially for being such a compressed period of time it's per day yeah it would be the, the most probably most people per day compared to summer and winter so that's yeah that'll be the next big test big uh you know i mean you you folks saw it yourselves what what summer looked like you had to rejigger your budgets and expectations and you came out with some great numbers all three reported great numbers in some respects better than last year obviously in terms of golf rounds etc uh but you know, you, Bill, you even said yourself, you got in the black in the new normal of where you were trying to get back in the black for your summer that didn't start to what, late June. Um, so hats off to you guys for pulling off what you did for the summer. And as you prepare for certainly the foliage traffic and then of course, the coming winter season, that's, that's the, the majority for all of you for, for your business. I think, um, any, any other Thoughts uh, from you guys that you want to share or anything we didn't touch on? Um, we... Yeah, I think that, you know, we're all, all the ski areas are going to be giving more information out. You know, it's going to be dripping out as opposed to uh, a big steady stream of, you know, big new relevant, you know, relevant information. We're going to be pushing stuff out as we can do it. And obviously, you know, we're making the best chance or best plans that we can. And they might change. And I think, you know, we all plan, we all know they're going to probably change. So we will, uh, we're putting it out there. We're trying to work together. We'll, you know, we've got all of our teams are working around the clock trying to make sure that it's going to be a safe, um, fun season for everybody. So yeah. I agree with that. You know, the famous saying that all battle plans are perfect until the first shot is fired. So <laughs> that's right. <laughs> And John Hammond, you had a good quote from Churchill on that very point. Yeah, that's this is what plans are. Uh, plans are uh, of little importance, but planning is essential. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> There's all sorts of them. You know. Oh yeah. <laughs> well, you guys are dealing with it in the best possible way. You're still smiling, keeping your chins up. I mean, the ski industry is the most resilient, optimistic, and innovative obviously in my opinion, and in, in the state and across the country, but you you truly really are, especially with what you have to deal with. And so hats off to you guys. And thank you so much for tonight. This has been fantastic. Um, any any other thoughts? And, uh, you know, just let me know any closing thoughts and then and then we'll kick it back to, to Abby to, to close it up. We'll be all set. Thank you. <laughs> thank you yeah, so much. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Yeah, with that, we'll uh, turn it back to our great host, Abby, from the museum, if she's tuned in here. I am here. We are. Thank right. you guys so much, Parker, Bill, John, and Bill, for what was really quite an honest and candid conversation. Um, I know I, I likely speak on behalf of the entire audience um, for that discussion. It was amazing. So thank you so much. Um, and thank you to all of you that joined us tonight. There was a really... A really good number of you here, which is great. Um, don't forget your donation could win you a pair of socks. Um, the donation link is in the chat. Our membership drive launch is tomorrow. We'll be sending more information in our e-newsletter and social media um, on that. And these uh, Red Bench events are scheduled monthly. So we have um, one of these every month. The next one is in just two short weeks. So October 8th, we will have Olympic uh, commentator Peter Graves moderating a panel of Nordic skiers and discussing the past, present, and future of Nordic skiing. Uh, registration for that will open soon. So I hope you'll continue to join us on these talks. Um, and I just want to thank you all so much for being here. Really appreciate it. And that is it. Have a wonderful evening, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Right. Bye. -bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs>